This grant was part of DOSER, which was a Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion project. Um, and Dr. April Sievert and I, uh, early last year, put in a proposal to have this event on our campus. Um, Dr. Rob O'Malley of the AAAS will be talking a little bit more about the workshop tomorrow, which I hope everyone will be able to attend. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over um, to Rob. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, so this panel and tomorrow's workshop were sponsored and co-organized by the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, or, or DOZER program, um, within the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, our program was established by the AAAS in 1995 to facilitate communication and engagement between scientific and religious communities, recognizing that these often overlap. The DOZER program builds on AAAS's commitment to relate scientific knowledge and technological development to the purposes and concerns of society at large. Um, some of our past and current program activities include public lectures and panels on a wide range of science and society topics, from evolution to gene editing to climate change to artificial intelligence, and these are um, available online at our website. We host symposia and workshops at scientific society meetings in university campuses to support uh, inclusive engagement by scientists. We have sponsored culture and religion journalists to report on science and technology issues among their readership and uh, uh, constituencies so that um, their readers are uh, well informed about uh, emerging trends in the sciences. And we have programs to support seminaries, theological schools, and synagogues in incorporating science content into their institutional curricula and in professional development activities. And you can learn uh, more about all of these programs online um, and also sign up for our newsletter um, if you're so inclined. Through a competitive selection process, Indiana University was chosen for one of six campus events to support culturally inclusive public science engagement in 2018 and 2019 by our program. To ensure that we are being true to AAAS's mandate to ensure that science serves all of society, it's critically important that our program and AAAS as a whole be reflective and deliberate about including underrepresented and marginalized communities in our activities, especially those that have been directly harmed by the practice of science. Indiana University was chosen in large part due to the application, which was submitted by the Office of NAGPRA, that proposed to focus on engagement with and within indigenous and Native American communities. And we're very thrilled to have this program here today. Um, my role today is essentially as a facilitator for the invited panelists and the IU community. Uh, while I will be moderating the discussion, mostly I'm here to listen and to learn. And I, I do welcome and appreciate your, your uh, making time to join us today. So, without further ado then, I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker, Professor Annette Lee, um, who is Associate Professor of Astronomy and Physics at St. Cloud State University. She is the Director of the St. Cloud State University Planetarium and Honorary Adjunct Associate Professor at the University of Southern Queensland in the Center for Astrophysics. She is mixed race Lakota and her communities are Ojibwe and Du Lakota. She has over three decades of experience in education as a teacher, teacher educator, program administrator, visual artist, and researcher. She's also founder and director of the Native Skywatchers Research and Programming Initiative. Native Skywatchers seeks to revitalize indigenous star and earth knowledge, promoting the native voice as the lead voice. The overarching goal is to communicate the knowledge that indigenous people traditionally practice in a sustainable way of living and sustainable engineering through a living and participatory relationship with the above and below sky and earth. The program seeks to address inequities in education for Native young people, to inspire increased cultural pride, and to promote community wellness through a rekindling of deepening or deepening sense of awe and personal relationships to the cosmos. And she'll be presenting today on From Native Sky Watchers to Astronomy 101, Widening Participation in STEM. Professor Lee. My work in a parallel way um, has evolved um, in teaching introductory astronomy courses. So I've, um, I've been at St. Cloud State for a decade, and before that I taught at the Tribal College, Fond du Lac, in northern Minnesota. Um, so I've been, I have basically uh, taught introductory astronomy for over 15 years. So um, anyways, um, when I look back on this journey, I can see that the the way that I taught astronomy was very different, and that I still do teach astronomy, it's very, very different. Because there's so much of the culture and the art that informs um, my 
effort to communicate these ideas in science that I love so much. I am a person that could never pick one, despite being told that over and over, and very stubborn, and um, I'm glad in a way, though it's been hard, because many times in science I was told, you know, you can do art, but you can only do it on the side, like it has to be a hobby. You have to give that up. We had to give up, you know, what we wanted to do, so you have to too, right? Um, but I have very strong uh, cultural reasons rooted in actually um, uh, ceremony and strong spiritual practice for not giving up either one. Um, so Native Skywatchers, um, this is my uh, crazy vision in 2007. I really had this idea where we should um, talk about this cultural star knowledge and uh, do something about it and not just let it slip away. So Native Skywatchers um, revitalizing, starting with our own Ojibwe and the Dakota Lakota star knowledge. So these are some of our team members. This is important to say though, this is really a community effort because it's no longer the case that there's one all-knowing elder. Like that just doesn't exist with the star knowledge um, in our communities. It's more like the case that post-colonization that there's like one elder has this fuzzy memory of something or maybe there's something written down, a historical con context. Um, so it's basically, we're forced to collaborate, which in a way is kind of good. But it's important to point that out, that it's different than other kinds of knowledge, maybe. Clicker? It's okay. So um, then our circle just keeps growing um, with whoever wants to jump on the bandwagon and be a part of this. Um, these are some of the folks. We started out by going around and getting elders, um, giving them tobacco, and then just explaining what we wanted to do and asking them if, if, they, if that was okay and if they wanted to help out or be a part of it. So it started with really that first step was a prayer. Um, so a couple of these guys already passed away, um, like Paul Schultz, he's from White Earth. When I first met him, um, he said that uh, he was really excited to talk to me because he had this vision that the star knowledge would be coming back, but he, call, he said it would be coming back through the young generation in this process, and he called them uh, star readers. I'll never forget, because I've never heard that term anywhere else. He called them star readers. Um, Arva Looking Horse, an old friend of mine, he's still around, um, and we're in South Dakota. But when I talked to him, he said, um, I'm so glad you're doing this, because nobody else is doing anything. That's what he said. I was really surprised to hear that, because he travels all around. Well, anyways, so, um, I think you can see um, more and more people. Um, we have a really strong Canadian collaboration now, First Nations, which I'm really excited and proud. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, okay, so one of the main things that we are doing is creating resources. So I literally have people that, I, you know, I run a planetarium, so I'll have third grade classes. So one day, this teacher came in from a town that's on the reservation. And so just by sight, you could tell at least two thirds of her class were native students. And so I'm out there pointing, okay, there's Mishi Baju, there's Bibun, Bibun Kiunani, and I'm pointing out all these Ojibwe constellations. And the teacher runs up to me afterwards. And she's like, how do you know any of this? Where can I get resources? I don't have anything. She's like in a panic almost, but really excited. She said, even the resource person at her school like, had nothing. And I really didn't even know about this, but then um, it, f it turns out that Minnesota has uh, their science standards, and it was actually fairly progressive, saying that in the third grade benchmark, that teachers need to show how people from all cultures have been participating in science. And in particular, the Dakota and Ojibwe use of stars um, to predict and find patterns. So it was this kind of this incredible convergence of things happening, and so, um, our first star, star map, Ojibwe Gisekanang Masenagan. 
So we painted this uh, myself. Um, William Wilson, he does the X-ray Ojibwe style, the, like this. And then this was based on Carl Galboy's work, who had been working on revitalization for like 30 years um, and never published it. So all three of our names are on here. Um, you can see a lot of the language is embedded on here as well, because just like the stars are a source, a direct source of knowledge and wisdom, the language is also just loaded with knowledge and wisdom, um, as many of you probably know. So I brought a few of these um, to give away. So I'll just um, you know, take one and pass them on. <laughs> So I'll just keep going. Um, from there, the teachers and other folks requested more. Um, see, we had NASA funding, a, a small amount of NASA funding. So every year we've been having uh, two-day summer workshops. And this started back in 2012. So that was a thing. I was like, we're going to have a workshop. What are we going to do? <laughs> so oh, I know. We'll make a star map. And so that's kind of how it came about. So just kind of kept going. So we created the Constellation Guidebook. You can get that on Amazon now. Um, by the way, you can get posters of these through the American Indian Center, these maps, bigger ones. Then the uh, Lakota Makoche Wichankpe Wawape, that's the Lakota Dakota Sky Star Map. Um, in the similar way, uh, I painted this one uh, myself, actually, and then a guy, Jim Rock, helped out with the language. Um, then there's the Constellation Guidebook. So. Um, I'll just keep going. Then in 2015, um, this guy knocked on our door. Um, it turned out he had come all the way from Winnipeg, uh, and he's a Ojibwe, uh, not Ojibwe, in a new elder. And he has been going around with an inflatable planetarium, collecting star knowledge, uh, totally grassroots, doing the same kind of thing, um, but more hardcore in a way, because he goes on the dog sled way up north, and he says, uh, he can only get to those communities way up north when it's all frozen. On, in the middle of winter, on the dog sled, he goes. So he's a really great guy, and then he gave us tobacco and asked us to paint their map like the one we had. Um, and I guess, like, the one thing I'm proud of is that it's like, there's a lot of star maps out there, you know. It's a kind of a common thing, and there's a whole historical record. But the idea of um, putting our cultural knowledge there and making that like in brighter neon colors and also including the aesthetic, the art, like make it beautiful. So we want to like just dive in there and swim through the stars there, you know, and know more. So I'm really proud of that. Then those, those third graders just kept asking about those Greek constellations. So I had to go ahead and burn the midnight oil and paint this fourth map. The one thing I learned about this is that, that Greek, uh, those Greek constellations handed down to us by Western science, they're not really, there's more to the story. Because I went around and asked people that are um, historians and astronomy historians and cultural uh, anthropologists, and it was really like basically get a different answer everyone you talk to. But the best I can figure, I started to just begin to tell that story, that many of the Greek constellations, especially the uh, zodiac, are borrowed from the Babylonian culture. Um, so where's Babylonia today? Iraq. Iraq, yeah, Middle East. And I love that it brings us back to that same point, that we really are all from Earth looking up at those same beautiful point, pinpoints of starlight. So um, I just want to point out that this work has a strong component um, of not just science education, but also wellness. Um, yeah, we're trying to recruit more students into STEM um, and give, give people and children that opportunity. But at the end of the day, it's actually the sad reality that um, in our communities, you know, sci people are not exactly sold already on science. I was part of a NASA grant. We were giving away like an, a summer internship. It was like $10,000. Um, but you have to go for like, you know, six weeks to NASA Center. And it just, you can't get anyone to sign up. You know, people are sometimes not a big fan of science, don't trust science, and or 
have too many more pressing life issues. You might have kids, you might be taking care of your parents, you might have three jobs. You know, this idea of just picking up and going on this luxurious you know, trip to NASA, it just doesn't fit reality. Um, so anyways, I'd just like to point out that Minnesota is known for having this really you know, nice Midwest high standard of living, um, but there's some problems there. Um, Minnesota is always uh, like top three in the uh, discrepancy between majority and minority students in education. Um, there's also apparent in uh, high school uh, graduation rates, it's just slightly more than 50%. That's not good, that's not good right? Um, then we've got around the reservation, like at Fond du Lac, you know, dropout rates more than 60%. Um, so then I'd like to also point out the native youth suicide rate. Folks, it's three times higher than any other race. And that even includes um, almost the national average. Like, these are my kids, you know what I mean? Like this is just, there's some deeply embedded problems there. So this is what I'm trying to make a small contribution to, to make a, a positive change, to bring hope, um, to give choices. Okay, so we do a lot of workshops. Um, some are more science-based, some are more art-based. So we see, received um, several art grants. It's all about you know making and doing. Um, we've gone around to a lot of different tribal colleges, um, nationally, even globally, talking about this work and trying to help other communities to create their own program similar in wherever they're at to jump in. Um, we've done traveling art shows. Um, these are based on the, basically we have workshops where people think about their connection to the stars, whether it's through culture or more of a personal connection, try to express that visually, which is really, takes a lot of courage. And then um, we were able to do that for a few years and then we bundled everything into a traveling exhibit. Okay, so we've created a curriculum, a lesson plans, workbook, uh, very much rely on the visual language, um, hands-on planospheres. And last but not least, uh, this is the um, collaboration. We did a permanent exhibit at the National Science Museum in Canada. So I'm really proud of this. A lot of the work um, was directly put on the wall um, for a large number of people. Um, one of the things I like to point out is this is about doing both. This is not about like throwing out uh, science and just doing our own thing. We call this two-eyed seeing. So this is a Mi'kmaq elder, um, and he said, learn to see from one eye with the best in indigenous knowledges, and from the other eye with the best in Western knowledges, and learn to use both these eyes together for the benefit of all. Uh, the gift of multiple perspectives. And that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do. It's actually really hard to do both and to not bring down the bar, but to really keep the quality as high as possible, doing both. That's what we're trying to do. So we've done a lot of videos, short storytelling videos. Um, so this is just sort of a sample. A lot of the artwork and science, and then like this is Carl telling the story. Those are some of the videos that you can find these on uh, YouTube, on, on Vimeo, and really just the beginning. I hope to do more and more and more with the video animation. So from there, you can start to see it uh, migrating into uh, astronomy, introductory astronomy. So I teach large lecture classes um, at the university, um, Astro 101. In one class, I usually have about 200. And the other class, I have about 60, the small class. So one of the projects that we do, um, I have students make videos. It's a two-minute video project. Uh, I've been doing this for quite a while. But every year, I am just blown away at the number of super fantastic projects. I mean, the project is to say, um, like, astronomy in our lives. So it's like 
I don't want to hear just like a PowerPoint re regurgitating the textbook, but what does it mean to you? So have some science, but have something of you, something cultural or personal. So this, this is some of the curriculum that I've developed for my classes. A lot of relationship with the night sky and bringing in other cultural knowledge of, say, for example, like the Big Dipper. Um, I have a photo gallery of, hey, let's, each one of these is an iconic image, a story that you just, you're going to be blown away when you hear this story. And then that's what we wrap our uh, classes around. So going back to that report on uninspiring introductory courses, this is what I care about and also um, those unwelcoming um, academic environments. It's dumb. So that's it. Miigwech, Palamia. Thank you.